Hello, everybody. Um, I'm really happy and really excited to be here with you guys again, at least virtually speaking. So uh, currently, at the moment that you are going to be watching this, I'm going to be uh, in the air. I'm going to be literally in the airport. So um, I'm really excited, <laughs> but I'm also a little sad that I can be with you physically. And it is because today we're going to be talking about a very, very important topic, which is called climate change. OK, so today we're going to learn about what climate change is. Everybody's talking about this. And it's very real. It is for a reason. And it's something that definitely has to be in our list of priorities to try to solve. So we need to talk about what it is, what causes it. And then we're going to introduce our character, which is the third Leviathan, the climate change Leviathan. Okay, It's a gigantic monster that feeds on the necessity of human beings to create more and more consumption of, of you know, like uh, uh, gases that go to the atmosphere. And then we're going to uh, create a scratch demonstration at the very end. So uh, here is a visual representation of what climate change is, as we have seen them before. I show you the five Leviathans. Notice how this one is a little different from the rest. This one has a metallic uh, a chassis. It is, looks more like an android, more, more robotic, and definitely seems like it is ready to, you know, create some combustion. And that is exactly what the feeling of climate change is, because climate change is something that comes with revolution in our technology. Every time that we create a new technology, or at least when we used to create new technology, it consume more from you know the surroundings from the earth and during the uh you know the um the the revolution uh, that happened when cars came around um we started burning a lot a lot of petroleum a lot of materials that you know came from the compacted uh, uh compacted vegetables and animals that um, you know, spent uh, millions of years in the bottom of the oceans, right? So it become they become coal um, <clears throat> or petroleum. So <clears throat> let's look at first and what is causing this climate change. So the first thing that we need to know is that you know the the Earth has a certain layer that doesn't allow the sun, uh, the sun rays to to go back to the atmosphere, right? That is one of the main reasons why we can actually live in the surface of the earth, because uh, here we have the sun. Here on the left, we have the sun and and the sun releases something called photons. Photons are a form of energy. They're basically, you know, a tiny, tiny dots, tiny points of energy that reach the earth at the speed of light. And then there is a layer outside of the earth, you know, in terms of the mass, the rocky part that is the atmosphere, the most of the atmosphere that contains many types of ga gases, including, uh, you know, the, um, um, oxygen, uh, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Those are the four main components of our atmosphere. But these gases are in charge of letting the heat inside, but not at such an efficient rate so that the, the heat cannot escape. So our Earth has heated up a couple of times over its history, and we are going to look at why it is so important for us to make changes in the way that we produce energy, okay? Because uh, it is not normal in terms of the mother Earth. So here we have a comparison of Mars and Earth. And here on the left, well, it's maybe a silly representation where I just changed the, the icon, iconographics of the um, of the of, of the Earth to turn it into Mars. But what I want to represent here is the fact that Mars has lost their uh, their gases. You know, has lost its gases. It doesn't have the gases that that allow the heat to stay in the atmosphere. Therefore, it's really really uh, hot. Okay, but there is a second problem, and that is that the sun rays that come along, come with other types of rays that are very nasty, very nasty for, for life to grow in. Example is UV light, but also, infra, uh, uh, you know, like um, um, a very, very strong uh, sun rays, right? Like gamma rays and, you know, X rays. So all these things are usually blocking the atmosphere. But in Mars, this is not the case. And that is why we assume that there is no life in the red planet. So just some interesting fact, if you are interested in this stuff, is uh, that Mars is half of the size of Earth, but it's twice the size of the Moon. Okay, and the reason why it's, called, it's colored red is because there is a layer of rust that is forming on its surface. So the gas that we're going to be talking about today is called carbon. 
okay, uh, carbon dioxide. So it is um, a molecule, um, a, a two molecules of oxygen and one molecule of, of carbon, I believe. Let's check that. Um, so I apologize also for the improvised, you know, version of this uh, presentation. I don't have all of my materials. Because as I, as I said, I'm ready to travel. So I am, you know, very um, 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 improvising a lot right now. Oh, phew. Yes, so carbon dioxide is a molecule of carbon with two molecules of oxygen. So this comes uh, naturally, <laughs> speaking naturally, you know, out of volcanoes, uh, volcanoes, volcanoes. When uh, you are, you know, the materials from the earth just burned at very, very high temperatures, it gets released into the air in such a way that sometimes in the past, some vol uh, volcanic activity, very intense, has covered the air completely. So it has covered, it has created some sort of blanket where nothing, nothing, nothing can pass, right? So these were very, um, uh, very low days, uh, uh, days with very low temperatures. So there was no heat. But then the other, the other thing happens when, you know, you have a certain concentration of carbon dioxide in the air that is not that high to block completely the sun rays. And it is because it forms a very impermeable layer for sun rays. Okay, so if it makes its way in, it can make its way out. And therefore, the temperature of the planet starts increasing. Okay, and these changes in temperature are usually gradual. So that means that on, the, on a geological scale, um, that last millions of years, these patterns are normal. It means that, you know, certain changes in the surface of the earth, like for example, the arise of, you know, the green plants that was unprecedented in the history of earth that happened 500 million years ago that we have it right here on the left. Uh, you know, uh, it correlates directly with uh, uh, the consumption of carbon dioxide because we know that plants capture carbon, right? If there is no carbon, there is no way to create carbon dioxide. So anyway, so these changes are normal over geological time. But the problem is that human beings have created um, a way to change these temperatures in a time, you know, in a very, very short time. Look at the scale here. So at the bottom, you have on the bottom left, 500, that 500. And let me see if I can point at it. <clears throat> so we have a pen here. So 500 is right there. Uh, that one represents 500 million years. And as we move to the right, we reach 2 million years, 1 million years, etc. Okay, so in this scale, you can see how even it's even gradual, right? It is like ups and downs, ups and downs, but it's in a time frame that goes from 100 million years to 60 million years, something like that. And then we move to 1,000 years uh, when humans were around, you know, and we started burning stuff, burning, uh, you know, like um, uh, dead trees or cutting trees and burning them to create uh, a way uh, to to um, to heat our food or creating shelter or you know harnessing fire, and that happened around the 1,000 years. So so then we move to the modern era, and then the temperature you can see it starts rising considerably, considerably, and uh, up to the point where we reach the present. So this trend is not a stopping at all. So we need to talk about the causes. What is causing, sorry, I am using some slides from the last time uh, that shouldn't be there. Uh, so from here, I'm just going to show you things with images. So what is causing the climate change? So most, uh, uh, the, the most important one is um, uh, combustion, combustion of, um, uh, combustion of carbon, <clears throat> the combustion of carbon, which is the, the petroleum, you know, the fossil fuels. Combustion of fossil fuels. <clears throat> Here it is. So you, you can see it every day, um, you know, in a very obvious way. It's like, you know, in the cars, that is it, that thing that is coming out of the escape of, of the car, this tube that is on the back, the, the car farts, <laughs> uh, are actually carbon monoxide and carbon carbon monoxide. Okay, that's the natural product that comes out of of the combustion process of these materials. So, if if it if it is possible, I would like 
uh, Kelly to pause the video and ask you guys if you know where uh, where petroleum and and uh, you know and fossil fuels come from. How are they formed? Okay, so I'm gonna stop talking <clears throat> to make a clear cut, and uh, you can give us your answer. Okay. Alrighty, so fossil fuels come from animals and plants that lived millions of years ago, millions of years ago, uh, fossil fuel origins. And these animals died, okay, and decompose as a natural process. Uh, but then sometimes some of these animals that were decomposed um, don't you know reach the surface sometimes they get a stock at the bottom and over time geological times a lot of uh, material gets a stack on top of it this is figure c sedimentary rock okay more and more layers keep accumulating and the pressure starts increasing so when the pressure is too high and the temperatures start increasing because they start moving down closer to the mantle, uh, closer to the, you know, the center of the earth, so the temperature rises, um, they change their, their chemical properties and become, you know, fossil fuels. So humans learn that we can harvest a lot of energy in the form of combustion from these fossil fuels. So by themselves, they help shape our civilization. You know, and there was the Industrial Revolution, <coughs> And the Industrial Revolution had the effect of changing the way that people created things by using fossil fuels. We basically started burning petroleum and other stuff uh, to power huge machines, like these pistons that you can see right here, to move gigantic structures, right? So that allowed us to change the way that we built the stuff. So at that time, it seemed like a good idea. And eventually, the first cars <coughs> came around. And the cars had the property that they had a smaller version of this, you know, uh, engineer machine, of this, this machine uh, inside. So at the beginning, cars were really expensive, really, really expensive. I were used only five, you know, aristocrats, very rich people. And they were very slow as well. And eventually, you know, technology kept advancing and they created newer models. So eventually they, we reached the point where everybody had the opportunity to buy a car like today, you know, but we never really thought about the, uh, the consequences of taking all of this carbon from the atmosphere, uh, the, the, from the, um, you know, from the earth that had been trapped inside of the, of the earth and releasing it into the earth. So that is why um, climate change was, uh, was born, really. You know, and then I think that it's important also to talk about what alternatives we have. And before jumping into that, we need to talk about why it is so hard to implement these changes. So the key to modern industrialization, industrialization, <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, like technological development resides in burning fossil fuels. Countries like Canada, the United States, Australia, or the United Kingdom, um, you know, already have a lot of capital. They already have a lot of money relative to other countries in the world. So they say, you know what, you, it should be time, like it's around time that we change the way that we consume fossil fuels. But the problem is that, you know, other, other countries that are getting there, like Mexico, you know, but also China, especially China, um, and, and, you know, uh, uh, other countries like South Africa or the uh, Emirates, um, um, you know, the <laughs> other countries in the Mediterranean, so, <clears throat> and Latin America. So they say, you know, we also, we would also like to have the life that you have in your country, you know, and, and they're right. They have the right to live well. In order to do that, they need to buy cars to move faster the products. You know, they need to industrialize using fossil fuels to produce plastics faster and better. 
So there is no, it is, it isn't really a clear solution because we can't really ask them to stop development. Okay, so the key to solve this issue is the development of clean energies. Clean energy. <clears throat> the problem with clean energies is that they are expensive to develop. And that is actually where you, you all come into the picture. Because, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not unheard of that uh, children have developed new clean uh, uh, technologies. You know, and eventually, if you know about this right now, uh, we can, you know, do something together to help shape the future and create better technologies. So that is really the key. And for that, we really, really need programming skills. You know, look at this. This is a wing fan, a wind fan. Okay, so it's a form of clean energy. These are huge, huge structures that you know, can be seen from many kilometers away. And they're so huge because they are uh, made to maximize you know, the friction against the air. And that happens only at certain heights. So in the case, you know, uh, they usually put them in very windy places, like on the side of the highways. They are very noisy. They create all sorts of contamination, but at least they are not burning fossil fuels. So if we really want to stop this problem, we need to create better technologies with, you know, the technology that is coming nowadays. We live in a very special time because the, uh, nowadays you have all sorts of tiny micro components that you can learn to use on YouTube, you know, to create on, uh, amazing gadgets. For example, you have the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi is a computer that is designed to create tiny robots and it really it was originally created to help you know uh, bring computers to people in developing countries and for that reason it is cheap relative to other computers so this is really the cheapest computer that you can get it works on linux the form of linux is an operative system that is not windows and is not macintosh okay but there are some very crazy projects <clears throat> Uh, save the earth okay where people um, just you know brainstorm to create camera traps but also you know carbon capture devices that are generally speaking rudimentary but they are efficient and if we were able to implement them at the larger scale we would definitely change the world so this this, if you want to learn robotics or you want to create entities that live in the real world that, are, that can, you know, interact with their environment, this is the kind of devices that you need to use. For example, this one right here has a temperature sensor uh, or a pressure, uh, no, sorry, it's a photon sensor. So it detects light. So for example, let's assume that you create a new device, right, that you keep, you know, uh, on the side of the road or on the side of your house and you put one of these photo sensors next to it. Let's assume that the only thing that it does is to turn on an LED, okay? And what you can do with this is that after a certain time of, the, of, of day, you uh, automatically turn on LEDs, therefore saving energy, okay? So <clears throat> you can also adapt some solar panels to it, so it is very straightforward to use. Anyway, so cameras and other stuff like that. <clears throat> Where I can help you is with the coding part. So we are going to move into our coding project. Okay. Oh, no, that's not it. Ah, what happened there? There we go. Okay. So these are going to be the elements that we're going to cover today. Uh, let me just double check that I am recording indeed. Yes, we are. Okay. So these are the elements that we're going to cover today. So the first one is variable. So let's take a look at what a variable is. And for this, I'm going to show you with this sprite, uh, with the scratch pad, which is the, the one that everybody uses at first. So let's talk about variables. What is a variable? I want you to think about variables as boxes. Okay, boxes where, with, that you, uh, where you put a label on it, and then you use it to put in and get out elements that belong to a certain category. For example, let's say that your mom packs you lunch every day and it gives you a Tupperware. So the, the label for that variable is Tupperware. Every day you know that there is something to eat inside. You put it in, someone puts it in, and then you get it out. 
Okay, so this is an example of a variable. It's it it's it changes from day to day, but it always contains something that you know has the same attribute, the same property, and that is that is eatable. So let's take a look at how we can create variables. So the first thing we're going to do is to um, is going to the very last uh, block, the second last block from bottom to top, and that one is called variables. So notice that there is one there already. And if I bring this block, I want you to notice that its shape is different, okay, from the other ones, because it has round corners. <laughs> so if I click in that, nothing happens to the cat. There is no effect. I didn't change anything in the cat. But what does happen is that there is a number popping up, and that number represents the, the current value, the current food that the topperware has, right? It has a, a value of zero. So we need to talk about what type of data we can store in computers. And here we need to talk about something called primitives. The reason why they're called primitives is because they cannot be reduced to simpler elements. The first one is Boolean type. And let me see, here it is. Okay, set my variable to something. So the first one is a Boolean type. It's of two types, true or false. It's binary, just like a computer. It's binary, so it only takes a yes or no answer. It's called Boolean. The second type is integer. It's a number, a round number, okay? It's a, an, 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 a whole number. It, it can be positive, or it can be positive. It can be zero, but it can also be negative. So we have all of these options. <clears throat> the third one is float. These are fractions, 3.4, 2.5, 6.3, etc. Okay, notice the decimal point. And just like before, we can also make them uh, make them negative numbers. But also, we can make them integer numbers that are floats, like 3.0. This is no different than 3 in some context. In others, it's very different, okay? And the last one is going to be text. Hello, world. Hello, world. So those are the four primitive types. So now we have the value of my variable set to a certain value. Now let's say, you know, I want it to be a star at 10. It's going to be a score. Okay, so I'm going to set my variable to 10. Now, notice that in the left side of the panel, there is a square next to my variable right here. So if I click on that, my variable appears as a block at the top left corner of the screen in my presentation of the cat, and next to it is the value that my variable has right now. So, those are the variables. So, how do we set them up is with the set block that is right here. How do we change them, aka update them? Imagine that you are playing a game, and every time that you do something right, uh, you do something right, then the value gets updated by one. So, for example, this block that is called set, sets the value my variable of my variable to 10 every time. Even if the value is 15 or 16, it always returns it back to an original value, which is 10. But if I use the change block instead, which is this one, <clears throat> now notice how the value of my variable is 10. If I click on this, it's going to be 11, gets added one value, and then another one, and another one, and another one. Therefore, going up, we are updating the variable. We are not erasing it. We are taking its current value and adding one to it. We can also add two. We can add three, etc. But what we cannot do is to add a false or you know any other sort of data because uh, it, it doesn't even let me. Like if I'm trying to, if I try to write text in there, it doesn't let me. It has to be numeric. Okay, change always has to be numeric. So I believe we can add either integers or floats. Yeah, there we go. Okay, and if we add floats, then suddenly the type of my variable becomes float. It was integer before, it gets turned into float. Okay, so that's how this works. Then 
show variable, it's a form to put this block on the top left corner of our stage uh, without having to click on that button ourselves. That's all it does. And this one is the antagonist of the previous one, where it hides it. That's pretty much everything we need to learn about variables for now. And the reason why I'm telling you about variables is because we can use them in something called expressions. When, you know, in English, you talk about an expression, uh, you know, you say to your friend, oh my God, it's raining cats and dogs, or guinea pigs. I like guinea pigs too. Uh, and then they tell you, what are you talking about? No, they're not. Uh, and then you just say, oh, it's just an expression. It is something that you need to figure out. You know, if you are listening to one, uh, uh, one of your friend's expression, you need to figure it out. So the way that is given to you is not the way that it should be taken. And that's exactly the same for computer expression. So here at the bottom, let me see if I have a white block. No. Okay, so here at the bottom, I'm going to write an expression. We're going to write our first expression in, in computer language. That you have seen is nothing special. Four plus two. If I give you this, this is an expression in computer language, right? Because the way that I give it to you is not the way that you should interpret it. This, you know, is equal to six. So in other words, you need to solve it. You need to solve this equation in order to make it make it uh, uh, have a value. So <clears throat> the computers receive an expression. It doesn't matter how complex it is. Sometimes it can be very complex. And in return, it gives you a value. So that's why calculators are like the, the masters of, you know, handling expressions. <clears throat> but there are different expressions for the different types of variables. Or in this case, are integers. But you can also have floats. You can also have, you know, uh, false or true statements. And finally, you can also concatenate or change text based on different strings. So we're going to try to look at all of these ones. But I want you to notice as well that this value can be represented in many different types of expressions. Like, for example, 4 plus 2, but also 3 plus 3, or also 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus uh, 3. You know, that's, that's 6 as well. <laughs> that's 6 as well. Okay, so it can be very complex. The reason why we need expressions in computers is because these numbers, sometimes, these, uh, these numbers involved, these are called the operands. It doesn't really matter, but, you know, it's the numbers that are involved in an expression or the numbers or values <clears throat> that are involved in an expression. Um, so the, the, the operands um, are... <clears throat> so the operands are usually replaced by variables. By those containers that I told you about can change what they have inside, therefore changing the whole value of this expression. For example, let's call this four here, uh, well, it's an example, it's a value, let's call it my number. It's my num, okay? And my number can have all sorts of integer values. And depending on what number I have, I add two to it, and therefore we get my result. So notice how we know, we don't know at this time what value will result from this expression. It depends on the value of our variable. And luckily, it is our computer the one that figures these things out. For example, let's create a new variable. <clears throat> this is kind of like the most important step on, uh, you know, these, uh, these blocks that is called my variable. So notice how there is a white rectangle at the top left. It's called make a variable. It's different than other buttons because when you click on it, it takes you to a frame that says new variable. Give me something, give me a name. So I'm going to say my num, just like we promised before. And this one, we want to make it available for all of the different sprites. If there is a cat, give it to the cat. If it is a dog, you know, also make it accessible for the dog, etc. <clears throat> you also have the option to make it only like exclusive for this sprite. <clears throat> for those of you that might already know a little bit of coding, this is equivalent of making a global variable and a local variable. So I'm going to set this for all of the sprites. I'm going to and I'm going to click OK. Now notice how my num <coughs> it appears right there as a variable. <coughs> so if I drag it to the center and I click on it, the value shows at zero, uh, as zero. 
And the reason why is because zero is the default value of this variable, of any variable. So from here, we need to bring a new block, the set block. Click on the arrow and select my variable and then change it to whatever we want. We can say Uriel, we can say false, we can say etc. But because of the name of my variable, I can intuitively assume that this is a number. Could be a float, could be an integer. I'm gonna decide to go for integer. <clears throat> so I'm gonna say four. <clears throat> Set my number to four. And if I click in that block, notice how the value of my number changes to four as well. So let's talk about the expression. Let's put our variable into expressions. And for that, we're gonna need to go to the green blocks that are called operators. So these operators look like this. Not, notice how they change. They are not the same as the normal stacking uh, blocks that we have in all of the rest ones, right? So you can see how all of the other blocks have tiny indentations at the bottom. Operators don't have usually these attributes. <clears throat> what they do have is a round shape that seems to fit inside of these values, right? Or inside of other blocks. And the reason why is because <clears throat> sometimes you want to create behaviors based on the result of an expression. <clears throat> for example, how much is my num plus two? Let's say that, for example, you are trying to create some sort of, uh, you know, like a, <clears throat> like an autom automated system to let people in, in your club or in your class or whatever, right? And they have to be uh, uh, older than eight years old. So <clears throat> you ask them to give you your, their age, that's my number, they can give four and they can give three, but you, let's assume also that you're a really nice person, you know, and you say, okay, I'm gonna add two years to your age, regardless of what it is, uh, so that you can make it to the club, you know, you know, except that if you are, you know, like four years old, I can't really let you in because you are really too young. Uh, not to say that. <laughs> You know, I don't know, or whatever, in this example. So I'm going to place my variable here in my num, <clears throat> and my num is currently equal to 4. 4 plus 2 equals 6. You can see the number popping up down there, okay? <clears throat> so in your game or in your design, it's someone, you ask someone, hey, what's your age? And they say, oh, it's 3 years old. Then you say, oh, I'm sorry, you can't come in. You know, or if it is five, it comes to seven, and you say, oh, great, you be welcome to the club, right? But it doesn't depend on us. It depends on the number that is represented as my, as my num. <clears throat> so this is the example of our first, first operation, our, fa our first expression. So an expression contains always at least two elements, a value on the left and, a, and the right. So, well, I guess technically that's, two elements already. So <clears throat> a value on the left, a value on the right, and an operand, okay? Uh, sorry, an operator, which is this one. In this case, is that clause that is showing right there. So on the left, you can see that you have multiple operators. You have a minus, oops, that shouldn't happen. You can, you can nest them, by the way. You can put one inside of the other. So you have minus here. You have multiplication. You have division, just like a calculator. You know, so you can use a scratch as a calculator. That's great. <clears throat> and then you can say, okay, so my number can be, uh, you, we can subtract from my number at number two. But we can also, for example, um, <clears throat> divide this number by two or multiply it by two, etc. You can see how this works. But at some point I would say, okay, so what happens if I, I want to represent this expression right here? Let me, let me. Give me one second. Uh, new slide, there we go. Okay, here we go. So what happens if I want to represent an expression like this? Four plus three and the result divided by two. Okay, so this gives us seven, three point five, right? So is half, half of seven. <clears throat> so four plus three equals uh, a seven divided by two. Okay, so by the way, this is how computers resolve these things. Things that go in parentheses are sold, resolved first. So this is seven, and then it says by two. And then it performs the next expression. It, get, it gets simplified. Notice how it, get, it gets simpler. 
So this is equal to 7.5 if this is the value. Technically, the value itself is an expression. It's just not reducible to anything else. There is no operator. So remember, these are operators. Plus, division, multiplication, etc. So what happens if I want to represent my expression like this? Where I first add it and then divide it. <clears throat> so the way you do it is by simply nesting. So I get my number plus, uh, here it is, duplicate and put it in there. So duplicate uh, my number plus C, we say, divide it by 2. So how do I divide this by 2? So I can drag this block right here, get rid of this, and then all of this expression goes inside of here. So now we are we are dividing <coughs> uh, what we added. So my number is going to be equal to, let's say my number, where is it? Set my number to 4. There we go. Now we have 4 plus 3 divided by 2. So you can see that the way this is nested is very similar to the way that we represented it here. So first, we build 4 plus 3. That is this block. That is this block right here. This one that I'm dragging around. And then divided by 2, which is this one right here. Okay, so it is that's the way that we can kind of like compile or keep adding to our expressions making them more complex. But notice that at the very end, we keep having two values, one on the left, one on the right, and then an operator. Okay, in this case, all of the expression on the left that has the addition, and then the division by two. So that is, that is the example. And then we can also create uh, different types of comparisons. For example, we can say, hey, is a number equal to other ones? So these are called logical operators. They require logic. You know, it's when someone tells you, you know, what does your logic tells you to do? It's like, uh, okay, <laughs> so let's say, let's make a radical example. You're in a bridge. <laughs> Don't do this. Of course, while you're in, in, in uh, you know, Capilano Bridge. And someone tells you, you know, um, let's throw a coin. You want to jump if it is tail? And then... You need to use your logic, right? And say, my logic says that the result to that question should be false. The answer should be, definitely should be no, right? Because, and you know, you, you have a lot of intuition as to the logic behind, behind that argument, behind that statement is I don't want to jump for a coin, right? So it works very similar in computers. So computers basically compare uh, uh, something that comes out at, as false or true. Look at these uh, at these rhomboidal shaped blocks. They are like variables, except they have a different type of operator in between. That's called the logical operator or the yeah the logical operator. So if this one is comparing if two things are the same. Hey, is four equal to fifty? Notice how I am giving integer values. But what I'm getting out, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, what I'm getting out is always, always, always a Boolean value is false or true. Only those two. Even if I get a value inside, uh, you know, uh, um, a value as my, the members, the operands, what I get out is always false or true. So <clears throat> if 50 equals 50 and only then, give me true. Otherwise, give me false. Okay, it can be bigger or lower, but we can account for that uh, bigger than, less than values right here with the other blocks. There is one right there. Hey, is 51 less than 50? Not, is, not, it is not. It is bigger. Therefore, it gives me false. Hey, is 51 bigger than 50? Ah, the result is true. So that's how this works. And the reason why they're so important is because we use them to open or close the gates in our programs. Let me show you what I mean. So I'm gonna go into the events blocks, uh, sorry, the control box, the color is orange, is the fifth one from top to bottom. And then I'm gonna bring one new block that is called an if block. This one looks like this, okay? <clears throat> so you can see that it has kind of like a mouth, it's like a sandwich. So. Notice how the shape that is next to the if word 
matches the shape of this operator, okay, of this uh, expression. And the reason why is because if statements, if blocks take exclusively logical operators, true or false, to decide whether or not to run. Let's say, <clears throat> let's bring my number into this equation. I'm going back to variables and bringing my num. Okay, I'm bringing it right here. There it is. So I know that my num equals four. So I'm gonna bring this my num and put it to here on the left to replace the left. And now every time that my number is bigger than, let's say five, then we're gonna run the code that is inside. For example, I'm gonna simply say, say hello for two seconds, three seconds, but only if my number is bigger than five. Now my number is equal to four. You can see it here on the top left side of the screen, the current value of my number, right? So if I click on this, nothing happens. No behavior, because we didn't pass the gate. We didn't pass the test, right? There's like a tiny wizard asking for information, giving a riddle. If you solve it right, it passes, otherwise it doesn't. But let's say that we change the value of my number. Let's change the value of my number to six. Okay, now my number equals six. And if I click in this, my num is gonna be replaced to the number six and it's gonna get evaluated. Hey, is six bigger than five? Yes, it is. So I click on it and now my code runs. Okay, so that's the gates that I'm, I'm telling you about. <clears throat> now, when it gets really fun is when we start using the user's input to decide what value my num takes. So let's do that right now. And that one is located in the sensing blocks. It is the sixth, the sixth one from top to bottom. <clears throat> the color is pale blue, okay? In, in contrast to the, 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 the dark blue that is the first one motion, the sensing is like a aquamarine blue or teal. So notice how you have some logical operators there, but they are very special because they evaluate if certain behaviors from the user are being triggered or not. For example, there is one block that is called ask, and that one is going to pop up a message. For example, I click in this. What's your name? Notice how the cat showed me something, just like with the say hello for three seconds block. Right, but in this case, there is a new bar that pops up at the bottom. And that one is asking me for information. If I type hello, you know, uh, that information gets stored in a variable, in a special container. So I'm gonna need to bring that variable, which is answer, is always called answer, and is found always below the ask block. So if I click on answer, notice it says hello. Okay, and just like with the other variables, if I click in that square, it's gonna show up in this uh, in this bar at the top left, right? Just like any other variable, which is fantastic. It makes logic. <clears throat> okay, so now let's say that the answer is what replaces my number. So if the answer is a number and is bigger than five, then we run the code. So give me a number between zero and 10, there you go. Okay, so now we're gonna ask this at the very beginning before we get into the if loop. And then we are gonna check if the number that the user gave us is bigger than five. If that's the case, then proceed and run the code. Otherwise, don't do anything. So let's run this, <clears throat> there we go. So give me a number between zero and 10. So I'm gonna give four. And because I gave four, nothing else happens. Let's repeat the process. In this time, I'm gonna give six. There we go. So I click six and the cat says hello. So we pass the gate. Okay, so that is how we can control the behavior based on the user's input. So there are other types that we're gonna see later when we create our RPG. Like, is this a sprite? Is this cat touching this color? And we can create a sprite with only this weird color right here. If that's the case, then do something else. Is, you know, touching the mouse pointer, the user touching the mouse or clicking the mouse, then do something. Are you pressing the key bar, etc. Okay, so we're gonna look into those. So feel free to look into this and look into the different variables. <clears throat> Let me check the time. We have 44 minutes. <clears throat> okay, so in the last 10 minutes, 
I'm gonna uh, share, I'm gonna, you know, let you play the Kahoot with Kelly. And uh, if you guys have any questions, um, you know, you can just keep them for the next lesson. So we're gonna be coding our first user input game. Okay, it's gonna be a game, no longer an animation. Alrighty, so uh, I'm gonna let you with Kelly. We have 10 solid minutes. Bye.